the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Christ is in our midst. Good morning, Kalina. Wow, you guys, we thank you to practice. You're so good. Today we move on uh, to sermon number five in this series I have entitled The Rhythm of Orthodoxy. And uh, as most of you know, what I mean by this term, rhythm of orthodoxy, is basically what I would call the content of a normal Orthodox Christian life. Thus far, we've gone over five components of the rhythm of orthodoxy, and you can see them on your sheet there. Uh, number one, the belief that the truth of things can be known and the desire to know the truth and do it. Number two, which I also combined with number three, personal and corporate prayer. Uh, number four was fasting. Number five is the reading of the scriptures. And today we move on to item number six, which is total transparency to at least one other person in our lives, right? So this particular piece of the rhythm of orthodoxy, I want to look at from three different angles. First, I want to look at it from the angle of scripture. Secondly, I want to look at it from the angle of what I would call sort of quote unquote practical life. And lastly, I want to look at it in the context of the church, and particularly in the context of the relationship between the priest, the spiritual father, the spiritual child, the sacrament of confession, and sort of that, that framework. So let's begin with the scriptures. First of all, something very simple, and that's that nowhere in the scriptures does it say we are not to do this. All right, so that's a, just a simple point. Secondly, uh, in more than a few places, it either explicitly says or it strongly implies that this is something that we do. This is something that was part of the practice of the early church, of, of revealing one's inner life to another person or to the community at, at large. <clears throat> when we first meet St. John the Baptist, right, on the, uh, at the Jordan River, if you can follow along on your sheet, we are told, quote, now John himself was clothed in camel's hair with a leather belt around his waist, and his food was locust and wild honey. Then Jerusalem and all Judea and all the region around the Jordan went out to meet him and were baptized by him in the Jordan, confessing their sins. Right? So that, those last three words are the key. Right? There was a confession of sins publicly. During the ministry of our Lord, we are told that sort of in two different places, once before the resurrection, and once after the resurrection, something related to this. Before the resurrection, we read in Matthew 18, which you have in front of you, Truly I say to you, whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. The Lord is talking to the disciples. And then after the resurrection, something fairly similar in John 20. So Jesus said to them again, Peace be to you. As the Father has sent me, I also send you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. Now, the reason I like those passages is because although they don't explicitly talk about the confessing of sins, I think it's fairly safe to infer that the, the, the disciples can't forgive or loose or retain sins that they aren't aware of, right? So clearly there was a practice of revealing sins to one another. And lastly, and this is probably the most kind of definitive and unequivocal statement in scriptures on this point, is from the, gospel, uh, the letter of St. James, uh, which says, quote, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. Pretty unambiguous. All of that to say that the scriptures witness to this practice of transparency. The, the Bible shows us that this is what God wants us to do. And, and I would even go so far as to say that the reason God wants us to do this is because he knows that in revealing ourselves to another person, we are healed, right? It's a healing process, right? Which we'll talk about more in a second. So my second point, which I, I said is more the practical life context of this. <clears throat> Here I have, have two things I would say. First, is that when we are spiritually ill, and of course we're all spiritually ill in varying degrees, 
we tend to want to hide that illness, right? The, the best example, really the most extreme example, which is also the easiest example, is that of an addiction, right? Let's say, we're, well, let's say we have an addiction to watching pornography, let's say. What is our default tendency, right? Our default tendency is to hide that addiction, right? We don't do it in public. We don't do it in front of all of our friends and neighbors. And the other thing is that the more we hide it, does it get better or does it tend to get worse? I think we all know that when we hide an ailment of that sort, it tends to fester, it tends to get worse, right? And it's only when we reveal it to another, right, when we finally come clean, as we say, that we begin the process of healing. And I might add here that the devil likes nothing more than when we have an ailment and we hide it. Because the devil is the one who helps to make it fester. He's the one who kind of stirs it up more and more and more as, as we go. Uh, but I would also add that the devil is a liar, right? The devil tells us, you can't tell that to somebody. Oh no, that's far too shameful, right? But the devil lies. He lies because he wants to keep us in his clutches, right? Which brings me to the counterpoint on this, which um, I'll illustrate actually from, I'm sure all of you have heard of the 12-step program, right? Best known through Alcoholics Anonymous. It's interesting that step number five uh, reads as follows, and it's on your sheet there if you want to follow along. We admit it to God, to ourselves, and to another human being, the exact nature of our wrongs, right? So here we have, even outside of the context of church, even outside of the context of the sacramental life, we have an awareness that in confessing our sins, they begin to heal, right? The other day I was at, I was at a retreat uh, for clergy couples, my wife and I, and one of the speakers said something related to this that I, I think is very powerful. He said, what is not revealed is not healed. What is not revealed is not healed. I think that's, I think most of us know that's true, right? So something to think about. Which brings us to the last overarching point I want to make, which relates more specifically to the role of uh, sort of the sacramental life and the role of the spiritual father and the spiritual child. And here, there are, there are sort of two points I wanna reflect on as well. First, there is the very specific sacramental role of the priest as the one who hears the confessions and grants God's forgiveness. Uh, and I, I once heard what I thought was a, a good analogy here for this concept of, of hearing confession and the relationship of the priest and the penitent. And that's uh, that, uh, that he, the priest in this context, is sort of like what we might call a midwife, right? You know what a midwife is, right? A midwife is someone who is present when someone is giving birth, right? They're just the third party, right? They aren't the one born, they aren't the one giving birth, but they're there to sort of expedite things, right? To make, to facilitate the birth, we might say. And in this relationship of confession, of spiritual father and spiritual child, and of course, also God, right? There's three people at a confession, not just the priest and the penitent, but God. The spiritual father helps facilitate, we might say, or guide or shepherd the spiritual child into a new life, right? Just like, just like a midwife, right? The spiritual father helps the spiritual child see clearly so that he can throw off the old self and put on the new self, right? The new self redeemed in Christ, in the likeness and the image of Christ. Secondly, that's the first point. Secondly, there is the role of the, uh, of the spiritual father of sort of giving general guidance, which may or may not happen in confession. It may happen anytime. It may happen over a phone call. The essence is simply that hopefully, and this is an important caveat, we need to have a discerning spiritual father who hopefully is a little bit further down the road of spiritual maturity than we are, right? And assuming that's the, tri that that's the case, then the priest is sort of like, to use a really a, maybe a kind of a crude or simple example, the priest is sort of like a coach, right? Who sort of coaches us in our spiritual walk, right? Or, or to use another example, he's sort of like one of those guides, right? That takes people up the top of Mount Everest, right? He, he knows the way, 
right? He's seen some of the pitfalls and the perils, and so he can help us avoid that, right? He can guide us, he can instruct us, he can help us avoid some of the bumps and the bruises we might otherwise get as we try to mature as Orthodox Christians. A capable spiritual father can be one of the most important things in our, might we call it, rhythm of orthodoxy toolbox. But, and this goes back to our overarching point today, number six, total transparency to at least one other person in our lives. He can only do that to the degree that we are willing to, in fact, be transparent and be open and be honest and be vulnerable. The other day I was reflecting on this sermon and I was thinking it's, it's like a hospital, right? If I go to the hospital and I say, I'm hurting, what are they going to say? They're going to say, where? Right? And if I say, well, I'm not going to tell you, then the hospital is not going to be of much use. But we have to open up. We have to be transparent. So it all goes back to that same point. The need to be seen, to be transparent, as I said from my talk this past week I attended, what is not revealed is not healed. So that is point number six in the rhythm of orthodoxy, my brothers and sisters in Christ. And for those of us who are doing it, right, may we do it more. May we grow and advance and struggle to even be more transparent, more open to the person who we can do that with, right? And for those of us who aren't, and there may, may be bad, many of us who are not, <clears throat> or haven't yet, maybe I should say, opened themselves up. Today I want to challenge you to do so, right? To go deeper, to, to reveal yourself to another. We all have wounds that need healing. God has given us our brother and sister in Christ as a means to that healing. The rhythm of orthodoxy is powerful stuff. It is the thing that makes saints. May we all commit today, particularly through transparency to another, to go a little bit deeper in this rhythm of orthodoxy. Amen. Please rise.